patriotism, faith, national unity, education, fiscal responsibility, civility, the values that define America. Fascinating stories and talks from America-loving patriots dedicated to preserving freedom, opportunity, and justice. Welcome to the Friends and Fellow Citizens Podcast. Everyone, and welcome to episode 98 of Friends and Fellow Citizens. I'm your host, Sherman Talowski. Thank you all so much for joining me on this year's Independence Day. Today, we are celebrating America's 246th birthday. I love Independence Day. I'm sure you do as well. And you're looking forward to the barbecues, the fireworks, the celebrations, the partying, and who knows what else. I mean, <laughs> there's so many ways to celebrate this special holiday, and I I really appreciate you all uh, spending this time with each other, with all of us. If it's after Independence Day, I hope you had a wonderful long weekend, and I'm sure you've probably got some leftovers from 4th of July, and so the party kind of continues from now, (laughs) maybe for the rest of the week. Maybe we should have an Independence Week. Uh, It was a a bit of a national week-long celebration. Who knows? Do make sure to subscribe to Friends and Fellow Citizens to get the latest episodes and notifications, as well as subscribe to our email list to get some more news and updates as they come along. At the end of this episode will be my annual reading of the Declaration of Independence. It's a tradition that I've instilled in this part of the show. I think it's a great tribute to the historic document, as well as the signers of that particular document, which we cover in our Sacred Honor series, which is our episode once every four weeks. Our next one will be in two weeks' time. Now, let's get into our interview episode. Today's guest is Paul LaRue. Paul is a retired high school history teacher from rural southern Ohio. During his 30-year teaching career, he was the recipient of numerous state and national teaching awards. In 2020, he was appointed to serve on the Ohio State Board of Education. Paul regularly speaks on issues in education and history. You're going to really hear about some of the amazing things that he and his students have been doing to not only learn and soak in American history, but how they're putting American history into action. Let's hear from our guest this week now. Paul, thank you so much for coming on to Friends and Fellow Citizens on Independence Day. Well, thank you, Sherman. It's a great opportunity. I appreciate being asked. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much again for for taking some time. And uh, I know this weekend, you know, people are relaxing and it's great to delve into some American history, which is always a classic for me. I want to start with a bit about yourself as a teacher. Uh, Tell us about why you chose a teaching career and how you really got interested in uh, American history and, and really just leading up to the work that you're doing nowadays. Well, thanks, Sherman. That's a great question. Um, I'm from rural southern Ohio and uh, grew up on a family farm. And in my family, for many generations, you were either a farmer, a teacher or both. Uh, And so teaching my mom was a teacher. My grandma was a teacher. uh, You know, so there were there was a lot of there's always been a lot of education has always been a big part of it. When I was a kid, I was blessed to really become an avid reader at a young age. I used to love to read those biographies. I mean, you know, they were like, and I mean, I don't care all kinds and just things. And it just really got me, you know, interested in history. And and to this day, I think one of the greatest gifts was that, you know, at an early age, starting to read and just really learning to, to love to read and love history. That's wonderful. And I love how in the history, the word, there literally is the word story. And what would happen if we solely taught history just as a factual mission that we, we, if if we took out that personal side of things, how how do you think that would entail in terms of the ability for students to be able to learn other things too? It's not just, I don't think it's just a, you know, in in a vacuum, but what sort of effects does that have on students learning on history and other subjects as well? Well, one of the things that I, and I think it's, and, and I think you hit on an important point, and we'll talk more, of course, about the classroom. It's if you make history more of a story, 
unless a lot of memorization of names and dates and things, history becomes a lot more interesting. And, and so it, it is the stories. And, and, you know, certainly over the last some years, I've done a lot of work with uh, the World War One Centennial and, and the stories. You know, the United States was in World War One for uh, basically 11 months. And yet, you know, there were nearly 300,000 casualties, 100,000 U.S. servicemen lost their life. So the, the stories of the service and sacrifice, you know, it's, it's not about the number, but it's about the stories of, of those, you know, those, those soldiers and sailors and, and what they did. One of the, the really neat things, and a lot of school districts are using this now, it's where you do more of a language arts approach where you use, uh, you know, you're able to take, uh, if you're doing, uh, if it's 11th grade, you maybe take 11th grade English as well as U.S. history and you put them together. And you look at the, you know, the, you know, what's going on in the literature, what's going on as well as what's going on in history. And again, back to that, making it a story and it's all about making connections. The, the problem, if you just have random bits of information, not that there's, it's not important to know things, but one, I, I can see the faces of my students right now as they're like making the gagging face at me as I'm, you know, cause it's just, it's just too much. Uh, my grandmother uh, got her teaching certificate in 1920. And so one of the things when I would always visit with her is she thought it was important you knew all 88 counties and county seats in the state of Ohio because that was an important piece of knowledge at one point. And so, I mean, now I can say that I honestly know a lot of these because she would drill them into me. But, you know, you, you look at any kind of, that's always the problem with any particular set of facts. I mean, that was maybe that was important information in 1940 or 30 or at some point. But the number of counties and county seats in the state of Ohio right now, unless you're at a bar trivia contest, and I'm not ever sure that shows up in a bar trivia contest, those aren't necessarily terribly important things to know. Absolutely. I, I also agree with you because when I meet someone and and I'm just throwing an example, right? But if I meet someone and there's and they say, "Oh, I'm from you know, Cedar Rapids, Iowa," and I tell them, "Say, oh yeah, I, I've heard of it, or I know where it is." I'm just going to use an example. But you, when you know, pro, even just approximately where someone's hometown is, or if you've heard of it, you're, you're honest about it, it. It makes a bit of a stronger connection because then it's like, okay, this person at least at the very minimum, understands a little bit about maybe where I come from and or this is an opportunity for me to share about what I know. And this kind of leads me to my next question, which is about uh, going back to making those connections. How do the connections between history and civics, let's just say that application element, um, how how does that relate to you when it comes to your your philosophy or just the way that you communicate this knowledge and, and make students really reflect on the significance of our history? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And, and the way, the way that it's, I started to do this, and this is where project-based learning started to come into this is in the late 1990s, we went to what was called block scheduling. A lot of places were doing that. And you, and it was like everything in education, it's not one size fits all. The whole idea behind block scheduling is you had longer periods of time to do stuff. Now, for science teachers, it was fantastic because every day was like lab day. My friends that were math teachers hated it because you can only do so many things with math. Social studies, we were kind of in the middle. And so what instead of me lecture and we had two hour periods. So one year we had 42 minute periods and the next year we came back with two hour periods. And so. What it forced me to do in a good way was to start to get students out in the community and to start to do more things. And once we did that, and this gets to your point about civics, is that that's when you make those connections. And it's not that you don't have to know information from a book, but and, and I had a couple of friends who tried to stand and lecture for two hours. I would say my students would say that that was probably cruel and unusual. Uh, you know, you just can't do that. So, you know, what I started to do was a combination. I'd lecture some, we'd do an act, you know, activity, we'd get out in the community. And, and that's, I would say those are the things that students remember. I hope it makes them a lifelong learner and, and a participant in this, you know, in the process, whether that's voting or, you know, running for office or any of those things. Excellent. I, I think this is great transition to our main 
topic today, which is really about some of those history and civics projects that you've been involved in, Paul. Uh, let's start with what you and your students are working on when it comes to researching the Civil War. I found this really fascinating, especially when I read about um, an article detailing specifically what you you all are doing, which is part of it is identifying unmarked Civil War era graves of African American soldiers. Uh, uh, can you share a little bit about how this idea came about, and what what is it, what the process is generally like as you walk through the students in this new way of learning history in our country? Absolutely. Um, our local city, Washington Courthouse, is a community of about thirteen thousand, so it's a small, you know, small town. Um, one of the things that we would do with my block schedule time is this: the local cemetery is about four blocks away. So we would walk, I called it a poor man's field trip. We would hoof it out to the cemetery and we would look. In fact, the first time we pulled up, my kids are like, hey, where's the bus? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, sorry. So we would, you know, we would hoof it out to the cemetery and the kids would moan and groan. And so we had walked 7,000 miles. But anyhow, we would go out to the cemetery. And one of the things we would do is I would kind of give them a tour of the local graves. And one of the sections was of black Civil War veterans who had come back to our community and were buried in a, in a section of the cemetery. And some of the headstones had kind of slipped. Some of them were missing. Some of them had been, and it's not that the cemetery is not well maintained, but, you know, this individual headstones had kind of, you know, had, had I would say were in disrepair. And, and one of my students, it was a young lady, uh, she raised her hand and she said, don't these men deserve better? And I thought, you know what, that's one of the smartest things I ever, you know, I ever heard. And so by doing a little bit of research, we figured out that the United States government has provided uh, veterans since the 1870s a headstone at no cost. And so doing research, uh, we were able to, I mean, some of the headstones that were there, we were able to clean, straighten and reset. Some of the headstones were not there and we ordered uh, the headstones. And so what we've been able to do is we've ordered and installed 70 government headstones. And these are the kind like you see in Arlington National Cemetery. These are the these are what are called organ keys. They're the upright marble. They weigh 230 pounds. So, um, you know, it, it was and, and again, I'm a farm person. So I think there's something to be said for doing the brain work, but also the physical connection. I mean, my students dug the holes, set the stem, you know, with, with the permission of the cemetery. We worked with the cemetery superintendent. He was a uh, Vietnam veteran. And so he was very, this meant a lot to him. But, it, you know, and so to this day, and, and we started this project about 20 years ago, to this day, my students can say, hey, that I helped research and set that headstone. And again, that's that, that what I call a lifelong connection. Uh, that they're going to remember that long after they've forgotten a lot of the names and dates and things, you know, that I tried to cram, you know, cram down them in the classroom. Wow. Well, first of all, Paul, that, that is such a touching story. And when that realization, that light bulb idea comes from one of your students and when she makes that point of saying, don't they deserve better? I mean, that, that, that says it all about how important it is to, honor those who fought for our country. And in particular, during a very, very difficult time when we were at war, that was the only time when we really fought against each other. And I want to now ask about really some of what your students have been saying, because I'm sure that they're, you know, they're going back to their parents or t telling their friends, maybe from other schools, or from other classes, perhaps, at, at least very minimum, just sharing that with them what they did. You know, every single kid, at least when I was a kid, I always loved going back home and telling them you know, about my day, what I did and all that. So what have your students been saying and what, what are their thoughts about this project on how they can maybe not only just do th things for their community, but also be able to hopefully retain more of that Civil War the history and, and all of that kind of complements the experience. Well, one of the things that is interesting that I didn't, and a lot of this I didn't anticipate when we went into this is, is the amount of pride in the, the work that they did. I mean, what's interesting is this, when they give cemetery tours now, and I, I'm actually, I give tours sometimes, this is, this section of the cemetery has become a section that is one of the places that folks are most proud of. They want to see this section. 
And so it went from kind of a, and again, I, I don't want to say that the cemetery was not maintained because it was, but this was just an older section that had kind of was in a little bit of disrepair. But, and again, the students, you know, like I said, they, and, and they reached out to other. So we've been in not just our community, but we've gone into other communities where they've invited us to work with them and to work. Uh, we were in Cincinnati is about an hour and 15 minutes from here, but we were invited to go to Cincinnati to a cemetery. Again, these are, it was a historically black cemetery uh, where there were unmarked graves. And, and for my students to be able to show, you know, show other folks how to do it and stuff, it, it's, you know, again, it's, that's that kind of power that, that kind of grows from that. Several of the soldiers in soldiers row began their life as slaves um, most of them came from Kentucky. Uh, you know, we're about two hours from the Ohio River. Uh, and so, you know, on the other side of the Ohio River is Kentucky, which was, you know, that was slave territory. And so, you know, a lot of these men were born in slavery, enlisted and served in the Union Army. And then after the war, they came to our community. Uh, one of my students' great, great grandfather was one of those men. Uh, and so, again, when you're able to do that, you know, you're able to, to trace that back um, to, uh, to slavery and to the fact that these, you know, and these men, you know, they got, they were in combat, they had health issues, you know, but they came to our community to raise, you know, to raise their families. And so I would say about half the soldiers in this section were born in slavery and about, about half were, you know, were free blacks that, that there were also a lot of in Ohio at that time. You mentioned the free slaves, but also obviously slaves come from the South. Obviously, Dred Scott really just threw that all into disarray because, you know, it, it was I, – I can't imagine what those stories are like, especially when you have that that horrible decision that basically said that slaves are property no matter what. And it just basically upheld – it basically repealed the Missouri Compromise. It, it just it, – it really threw our country into such disarray. And uh, I want to now ask about what – Parents have thought about this too, because you know this this has got to be a, a very huge enrichment to their education, and not to mention, as I mentioned earlier, it could be that these kids are going back home telling telling their family what it's like to be a part of this project. Well, absolutely, and and so you know, parents obviously this was something that was a, a, again a kind of a great source of pride, and we were. A lot of times I'm afraid, like a lot of times schools are kind of silos and they're in the community and everybody knows, but they don't really necessarily, I don't say they don't try to reach out, but there's not as much outreach. But one of the things that this really did is it brought, you know, it brought people in to, to the process and because parents would share this story and would tell. And this also then, which kind of got us into where we started to do the interviews with the veterans, because there was a group of veterans. Uh, there were three black veterans that would come out and watch my students work. And in the beginning, they didn't say anything. They just would come out and just kind of stand there and talk amongst themselves. And um, it, it, it was really kind of the neatest thing to, to see these veterans, you know, just kind of coming out. These were actually uh, two were World War II veterans and one was a Korean War veteran. And they would come out and stand and just kind of stand and watch the kids. And it was it was really neat to kind of see that. And then we were later invited to their Legion post. And, you know, and, and again, that's where that whole outreach uh, where that whole outreach thing comes. And I, and I do want to go back to your Dred Scott comment, which was a real smart comment. We started in this, one of the first things we did was we looked at the Underground Railroad in our community because the Underground Railroad came up, you know, obviously through lots of different places. And one of the things is after Dred Scott, there were uh, some ex-slaves who were living in this community who no longer could safely be here. And, and tragically, there's a story in our literally about a block from my house where a uh, ex slave who was living and working for a judge slave catchers came up in the dark of night, captured him threw him, and took him back to Kentucky. And I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's right in the middle of our town where this, this spot was, his name was John Marshall and he was, he was kidnapped and taken back into slavery. One of the things with any veteran is the whole concept of service and sacrifice. And I think a lot of times when we think about the civil war, we don't think about the issues that a lot of these veterans had following the war. And so these are veterans, you know, these were not the headstones that we did. These were men who came back to our community after the war, you know, and again, some of these men had life, you know, they had injuries. Some of these men had, uh, uh, I, I remember one of the veterans had uh, gone, he had gotten um, 
typhoid, I think. Anyhow, he was blind from his service. Uh, you know, there were these things. And, and his, uh, a couple of the veterans apparently were homeless. And so, you know, again, we can talk about whether we're talking about 2022, you know, or 1880 living in Washington Courthouse. You know, there were a lot of these issues that veterans had to deal with. And we've had a number of great guests on the program who really care about veterans' issues and about helping them, especially with PTSD and all that. So I, I, I think this is this fits so well with with our program and with the the amazing things that a, a lot of people are doing to advocate for veterans. Uh, Paul, I want to now turn to the next thing, which is uh, really about the your your role or your service for the Ohio State Board of Education. This is incredibly interesting to me because it's not just a history and civics connection, but it's also, I think, in recent times has been a bit in the spotlight. So um, in terms of learning or in terms of, you know, the, 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 the number of emotions that one can feel when going through history, you know, it's, it's a, it's not a, it's not a steady line here, you know, just reading about facts. So tell us about a bit more about the State Board of Education in Ohio and the, some, some of the things that you are tasked to do as, as part of your responsibilities of this uh, organization. Absolutely. Um, Ohio, like most states, has a State Board of Education. Uh, different states have it set up different ways. In Ohio, there are 11 elected members and there are eight appointed members. So we are a body of 19. I am an appointed member, meaning I have an appointment from, from the governor's office. Uh, I really enjoy. Now, that's a big group. Uh, Some states, it's all elected. Some states, it's all appointed. We're kind of a hybrid state. I really like a big, diverse group. We have, like all states, Ohio is, you know, everything from rural to metropolitan. So we we have a lot of of energy. To me, it's energy. I mean, you know, sometimes people like it where everybody agrees, you know, everybody raises their hand and agrees all once. We're, you know, that's not, that's not what this body is. There's, there's discussions. Um, one right now that it, I think ties into this is the particular committee that I chair. About 10 years ago, Ohio passed what was called the third grade reading guarantee. And it basically, the, the concept, and this was legislation, the concept that was passed was if you didn't hit a certain reading score in a third grade, you were to be retained. Now, it it makes sense. And I, and I think everybody, you know, it, because if, you know, there's all kinds of studies that show if you're not reading on grade level by third grade, the chances of things, you know, not going well for you are, are significantly worse. Now, we're about 10 years later. And, you know, some of the statistics say that 39,000 Ohio children have been retained. And we're not sure if that's a, you know what I'm saying, if that's a great, how much good that's done. Now, that's legislative. What we on the state board do is we set what's called the cut score. We set the score by which the students have to pass. So we work with the legislature to do this. But this is a good example of where, and I think everybody, it was all good intentions when they passed it. But I think you go back and you look at these things and you say, now, are we really doing what we meant to do? You know, and so, and again, the board, we don't do legislation. We set scores and we set administrative rules uh, to, to help support that. In, really interesting, and and I want to ask you now about the the history and civics element to it. Um, what what sort of things does the state board of education consider? Um, you mentioned how that you work with the legislature. My my assumption is that you you need some kind of as as the board you you need some kind of vision and leadership to where where the Ohio needs to go on improving education. So tell tell us a little bit about, as much as you can about what that process is like when it comes to history and civics. One of the things on the state board we do is we have a model curriculum, and that's designed to help teachers uh, as well as parents and students, you know, understand. And I, I was using an example of financial literacy. One of the things, and it, it comes like civics and like history, um, it's something that I think students are, and again, I, I hate to use the word ignorant because it sounds derogatory, but kids just haven't been exposed to find, and it's become such a, a, an important topic. In fact, the legislature for years, and I taught financial literacy in the classroom for many years, but they've now actually mandated that that students have it. I mean, there's a there's a creepy statistic that uh, you know parents don't talk with their their children a lot about finances, and there's some creepy statistic that they're more open about their sex lives and their financial lives. And you know, 
it's it's one of those things. So it's important, and that's and you need to start talking about financial literacy at an early age. I'm proud of the work that we have done at the state board, but I know that there's always a lot more. One of the things I think you always kind of juggle is the accountability factor beside, you know, trying how's the best way to achieve accountability. Uh, one of the things that the committee I was I work on was just tasked with was the state report card. Every school district gets a grade from the state. And then parents, and of course, the idea is so parents and, and students understand it in their community. And a lot of times then schools go out to the community and say, hey, we need tax levies and things like that. So that kind of accountability is really important. You know, people want to know what they're getting from their local schools. And so, you know, part of that becomes that whole accountability. And again, it's not the most exciting or it's not the most sexy thing in the world. But you know what? That's daggone important for folks to understand that. When I was younger, at, the very, at least, you know, there's there's a very simple saying, and you know, it's it, it's simple, but it applies to a lot of things. Which is, <laughs> the if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. I mean, that's that's been kind of repeated a lot of times. But what what are your kind of thoughts about just the 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 contentious nature that we're living in nowadays with school boards and curricula, and maybe some things that people can do to lower that temperature a little bit and really get back to some level of civility and conversation as I presume is, is something that is a, a principle in, a, as a member of the board of education. That's a good question. Um, I, I'll start with the, I'll say something nice. And that is, I think one of the good things that has come out of the last six, eight, 10 years is I think a lot of parents are starting to get really interested in what's going on in schools. And I don't want to say that parents weren't interested, but I can tell you for a fact, when I was a teacher and we'd have parent teacher conferences, honestly, unless Johnny was failing, many times you didn't hear from parents. You know, and I understand that they're busy, they're working, they have lives and things. And I think one of the things that's happened over the last some years is parents are starting to hear things about schools and what's going on. And so I think it's 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 brought a great interest. And, you know, that, I think that's a good thing. And I think folks have run for school boards who never would have run school boards before. And I think that's a good thing. I think the challenge is when, again, that whole civil discourse piece, uh, you know, that, that gets tough. And we have public participation at the state board every month. We have, the, we have monthly meetings and we have really unlimited time set aside for folks from, the, from around the state to come in. And it's sometimes it's something that we're talking about, but sometimes it's other things. Uh, a gentleman came in one time and he thought we, sh we should have seat belts on school buses. And he had all the statistics and things like that, you know, and, and you know what? Good, you know, good for him. We have those kinds. So it's we have a really an open forum. So I think it's always tricky to balance free speech, you know, with a civil open discourse. In politics, we always throw around dog catcher, but that's kind of as a as a, as a term to to use for for the fact that there there is an opening for for political participation if people want to take on that. And uh, uh, Paul, and now let's turn to uh, something that I also find very interesting. Going back to what we've been saying about honoring veterans and people who serve for our country, which is about the Ohio World War One Centennial. Uh, tell us about a little bit about that project and the significance of it in your view. Well, I was fortunate to be one of the uh, – I served on the Ohio uh, World War I Centennial Commission. And, uh, you know, I would mentioned World War I, I think, a little bit earlier. I, I think, generally speaking, the Civil War and World War II have a greater following than World War I. I would say World War I, everybody knows it, poison gas, trenches, blah, you know. But it's not something that I, I think we, we hear a lot about. And one of the really – neat opportunities was, and again, it connects back to the community. Uh, and one, one thing that most folks don't know is uh, there were about 70 plus thousand casualties, or, or I should say deaths in service in France at the end of World War I. And then starting in 1919, the government sent out a questionnaire. They sent out 74,000 questionnaires and they asked families, do you want your loved one's body brought home or do you want them left in a cemetery in France. And between 1919 and 1922, 
44,000 service members' bodies were disinterred and brought back to the United States and were buried in cemeteries. Our local cemetery, there was a soldier buried there in 1921. He was a pilot who was shot down. Uh, He was buried in a grave, then moved to another grave, and then ultimately his family asked his body to be brought back. That's a powerful and a fascinating story. In, in some ways, sadly, kind of a forgotten war for for America. It seems like out of out of the major ones, Civil War, World War One, Vietnam, Korean. But regardless, I, I think this is a great project to embark on, especially to get people to go somewhere and to be able to reflect, make those their their own reflections on that war of a hundred years ago. Paul, now I want to turn to the. A, a, a new project that I noticed myself is actually particularly out of all the statues, somehow the the capital tour guy that that taught me how to do a tour uh, pointed out this one particular statue. And I finally know someone who is behind this project. <laughs> and I'm talking about that, that amazing Thomas Edison statue in Statuary Hall where, as the name suggests, is where a bunch of other statues are. Um, but this one, it was, at that time, was the newest one, I believe. I believe it came on 2016, if I'm, if I'm correct. So, Paul, uh, walk us through, first of all, the kind of the basic process of getting a state to uh, replace a statue, because there was a, another statue before that, um, and um, that kind of the process overall of getting Thomas Edison to Washington, D.C., um, and and really just the significance of that statue to Ohioans and uh, the United States in general. Yeah, that's a, it, was, it, was a, it was one of the neatest projects that my students and I participated in. And it, and it goes back to every state has two statues in Statuary Hall. And, and, but in 2000, the Congress changed the law or the rule and states were able to swap out statues. And so starting in 2000, and there's been, Ohio was not the first state. I think California swapped out somebody for President Reagan, and there's been several. And every state does it differently. But what Ohio did is they decided to make a contest out of it. And this was actually run through the Senate. Uh, It was a Senate committee. And what they did is you were allowed to nominate, and you could nominate. And I think there were 93 nominations. You could not be living uh, I think that was really the only thing is one guy nominated his father, which I thought was interesting. Um, and my students as a class project, we nominated James Ashley. Now, James Ashley is a lesser known political figure, but he's important because he was a congressman who advocated for the passage of the 13th Amendment. He actually was the one who got the votes counted for the 13th Amendment. Uh, he's an Ohioan. Uh, he grew up. He's actually born in Pennsylvania, but grew up in Portsmouth, Ohio worked on the Underground Railroad as a young man, uh, but was really a uh, a real abolitionist uh, representative. And so we we advocated for him. And so we, you know, we invited the committee down, actually came to the high school. We did a presentation. We fed him lunch. We, you know, kind of put on. And, and but what we started to find out was we weren't the only ones. Milan, Ohio, which is where Thomas Edison lived, was advocating for him. Dayton was advocating for the Wright brothers. Uh, Ohio State University was advocating for Jesse Owens. And so there were all these really, and it was a really great, it was a great way for people to advocate. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, who I think his 200th birthday is this year, um, the folks down in Southern Ohio where he's from advocated for, for him. And so we all, you know, we all, so they cut the list down from 93 to 10. Now, my students were convinced James Ashley was going to be the final pick. In fact, I, I remember a student saying to me, well, should we get rooms reserved? And I'm like, uh, we might be getting a little ahead of ourselves on this. But uh, we, we were fortunate that our, our, our James Ashley made the top 10. Now, then they put it to a vote and we came in 10th. Well, I have to say kudos to you and your students because there's so many great figures to choose from. This is probably one of the most interesting, one of the hardest aspects of choosing the statues for the National Statuary Collection. When you're down to two, the same number of senators, it, it, it's it's a tough decision. So I I really appreciate how far you and your students came with James Ashley and ultimately going with Thomas Edison. And uh, certainly 
I guess there's probably way too many puns about the Edison having the light bulb move moment when he's holding the light bulb uh, and is the pose for his statue in the National Statuary Hall. Let's now move on to another another topic here. Uh, two more topics here before I want to get to an, another part as we wrap up our conversation about history and civics and. This is really uh, interesting. I, w- I want to, since we'll, I'll ask you just kind of one question, but it's really about the Black History Bulletin and the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. So, Paul, uh, can you walk us through what those two projects were and and the, maybe any connections that you find between uh, those two projects and any other ones that we've discussed so far or any of the ones that we haven't mentioned yet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Black History Bulletin uh, is a publication of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And it's better known uh, by Dr. Carter Woodson, who founded Black History Month in 1915. So it's an old, and actually the Black History Bulletin has been around since 1937, and it was designed to provide educators with good information um, about black history. And, and I mean, I, I've, I'm one of the, I'm on the editorial board for this and it's a real, I, I'm a contributor from time to time and it's, it's a wonderful publication and it's important that we continue to talk about black history, but all, black history is American history, and, you know, and then, I mean, that's, it's a part of that. And so I'll, I'll use that to segue into the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. In, in the year 2000, Congress passed a creating what's called the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. And it was designed to record stories of veterans. Um, There were 16 million uh, service members in World War II. There are about 240,000 of those service members left. Uh, In in 2021, the last statistic I saw said the remaining veterans died at a rate of about 234 a day. Uh, So there are very few. Starting in 2003, my students we participated in this and we had a shoebox tape recorder and we started with some of those local veterans I said about out at the cemetery. You know, we started talking to those veterans and recording their stories and um, both black and white veterans from our communities. uh, We would go out to the American Legion. I had one student whose grandfather would take him out to lunch at the Legion post and he'd get his friend say, Hey, you need to go over to the high school. And so we were able to collect um, 68 recordings or stories. Uh, and you can actually, they're all digitized now. You can go to the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project and they're all digitized. And uh, I think that 26 of those were uh, black veterans. A lot of them were black World War II veterans who were still serving in a segregated army. And I was always struck by how proud they were of their service. And in, and, and in many ways, some of the ways that they were not treated very well at all. Um, but it was great. It was a great way for my students uh, to interview. And, and sadly, well, most of the World War II veterans that we interviewed have passed. What what sort of things do you think, generally speaking, as you mentioned how, you know, it's, it is, it is sad to, to see, obviously, I mean, just, it's just the course of course of human history, but it's, as we unfortunately continue to lose World War II veterans and Korean War veterans, even some Vietnam War veterans, um, what sort of things do you want to see uh, see state governments or localities across the, the nation to do to um, not only push for oral histories, but but also get people to to be interested in meeting those veterans. You know, when it, it's a time when, you know, over two plus years of a lot of virtual stuff, I, I really hope that people can get back to meeting people and just getting that that sometimes that one time experience with with these veterans. Yeah. And I think it's, that's the one, another, one of the lessons that my students learned is, you know, we were able to create a safe place where veterans would come to my classroom. It wasn't, it would be like my conference period. And and one day a veteran showed up about two hours early and the office called down. They said, Hey, there's a veteran here. And I'm like, "Mm." so we got him a lunch and he sat in and you know what I mean? You, it's about making folks feel comfortable. And and when they do that and, and the connection between my students and myself uh, I've given three eulogies at veterans' funerals. I've been asked to be a pallbearer for one of these. And these were men I didn't know until they walked into my classroom. I, I mean, I can't even put into words what an honor that that's been for my students and myself. Uh, Paul, the, uh, as you recall from before the recording, when, when we spoke about the episode, 
uh, you share with me a wonderful article that paid tribute to your very good friend, Mr. Carl Westmoreland. Uh, what can you tell us about your close friendship with Mr. Westmoreland and and how that has become such an, an impactful relationship that has contributed to basically what you do as a history teacher and uh, all the other things that you are embarking on to this day. Yeah. Carl passed away just a month or two back and he was the senior uh, advisor at the national underground railroad freedom center. He had been a black community activist for years. Uh, You know, he was in his eighties, but what was neat about Carl is he would come up, we're, again, we're an hour and 15 minutes uh, from Cincinnati, but he would drive up to our community. He loved to meet with the students. And, and again, he kind of almost became like an uncle to me. You know, he was, he loved to get out. He loved to talk to students. And then he invited us down. And that's one of the cemeteries we worked in. The cemetery in which he is buried is one of the cemeteries where my students were marking unmarked graves. And, and you know, when we would do that, he would come out and, and talk to the students and, and there, you know, there's pictures of Carl talking to my students. And you know what? High school kids can be kind of squirrely, you know, but I, when he would talk, the kids would just sit and listen because he had such a great way. And it, and it was a great I mean, we're very rural. Obviously, Cincinnati is a, a large, you know, large metropolitan area. But but there's in the end, the love of history and the love of that kind of learning it bridges all those gaps. And again, it sounds corny, but it's true. Again, people sometimes laugh, but uh, one of the things that I would have my, my students, and these were, these were seniors, um, we would go out to the cemetery and we'd help put out flags for Memorial Day. Now, in our cemetery, there's, 13, there's 1,300 veterans' graves. And so we would put out 1,300 flags. Now, I had somebody say to me one time, well, that's something that fourth graders should do. And I'm like, I'm cool with fourth graders doing that. But you know what? High school kids doing it and then having conversations about, hey, this is a World War I soldier. Hey, this is a civil war. Hey, this is a black soldier. This is, you know, those kinds of conversations. And it's something simple. I think sometimes people make things too complicated and you have to do, you know, and, and I can tell you, cemeteries are always looking for help. You know, they're mowing, you know, they're just trying to keep the places mowed and trimmed. And so it was, you know, it was a great opportunity, but it was a great way to connect, you know, with the, with the community. Well, thank you so much for sharing about your relationship with with Carl Westmoreland and the impact that he made on the community. And if you can elaborate a bit more on you know, some of the things that people can do to honor not just his legacy, but the legacy of those who fought for independence. And today's Independence Day. It really is a great time to celebrate and to commemorate those who have fought for independence. So what are some things that people can explore as particularly parents uh, to enrich their kids' education, but also participate in this national endeavor to discover who fought for independence? Yeah, that's actually a great, that's a great analogy because I, I think you, you don't know like it, what, what might work like uh, interviewing veterans for the veterans history project. You know, that's wonderful. It, it's a, you know, it takes a fair amount of work. It might be easier to go, uh, you know, go to the next Legion fish fry and get, you know, just get to know folks in the community because there's so much history. You know, I found almost more history out in the community than I found in the books. And I don't get me wrong. I'm not saying throw away the books or I'm saying you, but I mean, it's, you know, you've got to, you've got to make those things. And so parents, and I do think that's a good thing about this current movement where parents are really starting to get interested uh, for, for instance, in Ohio, just it's a little thing, but some years ago, Ohio in the eighth grade teaches from the age of discovery to 1877, the end of Reconstruction, and then in high school from 1877 to 2001. Well, a whole lot of folks don't know that because when they were in high school, they remember you started in the same place and maybe you got up to the Civil War. So part of it is kind of understanding, you know, what's being taught, because I had people say to me, well, I can't believe they don't teach the American Revolution in high school. That's a that's a true fact, because there's so much history is now taught in the eighth grade. So part of it is also get kind of getting to know what's going on in your school. Yeah, I think folks, because I, I always I believe people all come from a good place, and I, and I think a lot of times people are just you know it is uncomfortable. I, I mean, I can tell you when I listen to some of the Black World War II veterans telling me about some of their experiences, it, it's uncomfortable, uh, and I I understand that. 
But yet, those are that's part of our history. And, and I think the other thing is we can do two things at once. We can talk about World War II and we can celebrate the service and sacrifice of 16 million American service members. At the same time, we can talk about, hey, there were 100,000 Americans of Japanese you know, descent that were put in internment camps. I mean, we can do two things at once. I, I feel sometimes like, feel like well, you got to be this, you got to be that. And, and we can do two things. And, and I think that's an important part of the story. Agreed. And, and maybe I just want to entertain an idea that that has been a, a bit of a theme, I guess, for the podcast, too, which is, you know, looking back at some of those early times, especially going back to the American Revolution, you know, it, it's I always th- say if we went back in time and we told them and uh, we told it the founders they say, all right, you gave us a constitution, you gave us a declaration and all that. Our country should be exactly the same as it is in 250 years. They would be absolutely disappointed because that doesn't mean progress. You know, over time, things have to improve. So I guess we're just using the American Revolution as an example, you know, um, what what are your kind of thoughts on just the, taking history, not just as a uh, chronological, you know, uh, puzzle of stories or and events, but maybe some of the other lessons, like, for example, the principles, you know, about the Constitution or a form of republicanism, republicanism in government. Um, how essential are, is that for the learning of history and for tying in history with those other subjects like, like civics? Well, it's incredibly important. And I think you hit on a really good point. And I'll, I'll go back even a hair further and say that one of the really interesting stati- – because I think people have notions in their head of what was going on during the American Revolution, and they have you know notions. A really interesting statistic is I think at that time in colonial America, about a third of the folks were for independence, about a third of the folks were for the crown, and about a third of the folks were on the fence. But yet generally you have this impression that everybody living in colonial America, you know, Wanted the, so, so, I mean, they were divided, you know, uh, the Federalist Papers and Anti-Federalist Papers are great examples of people trying to get at the same goal, but really going about it two different ways. It's not right and wrong. They're just different ways of looking at things. And now, Paul, as we, uh, as we turn to the reflection phase of our podcast, uh, as you know, you know, this podcast is named at for the first four words of uh, Washington's farewell address. And really looking at those principles of patriotism, faith, national unity, education, fiscal responsibility, and civility. Out of these six, which one or which ones do you think are most relevant to the topics that we've covered today with the projects that your students, you and your students have embarked on uh, to the other projects that outside of the classroom uh, that you think are particularly relevant, especially when it comes to bridging history and civics, but also bringing some kind of civility or some kind of some kind of continuity on learning continuing to learn history in the most in-depth manner well let me read you four lines uh from george washington's farewell address and this is uh, to me this is and i'm because this i'm an educator so promote then as an object of primary importance institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge in proportion as the structure of a government gives force to public opinion it is essential that public opinion should be enlightened. Let me say that again. It is essential that public opinion should be enlightened. What a, what a wonderful, you know, what a wonderful way to frame the, the power of education. It absolutely. Really entails all those, uh, all those values together. And as, as you know, with the, we're, we're pre-recording this episode, but and the release of this episode uh, to tie really tie it all in, I guess this is really the grand finale here, uh, which is Independence Day is today. And I know a lot of people are excited for the festivities later today. Uh, so, Paul, Paul, what does Independence Day mean to you? And what are some things that you like to do to celebrate Independence Day with your family and friends? Well, Independence Day to me is a wonderful, it's a reflection. It's another reflection day for me, like a Memorial Day. But I really two things. One of the things it does for me is I'm thinking about the semi-quincentennial, which is a mouthful. Uh, that is the U.S. 250, which will be celebrated in July 2026, which is not that far away. 
And so all these things that you've been talking about, this is, you know, this is coming up real soon. So it's a great opportunity to start to talk about the American Revolution and George Washington and the sacrifice. Uh, again, semi-quincentennial. That just rolls right off your tongue. <laughs> uh, the other thing that I will be doing, as I love to do, is I love to roast a hot dog on the grill. I'm not about boiled hot dogs. Some people like boiled hot dogs. Not me. I got to grill my hot dog. <laughs> Uh, that's wonderful, and, and uh, for you, I'm sure you've got maybe any any plans for fireworks. I'm not sure if you can let, set fireworks where where you are, but um, uh, it's it's certainly certainly one where if anyone is in D.C. for July 4th, definitely have to ch- take a look at the fireworks there. We actually have a we have a wonderful local. Believe me, it's not Washington D.C., but Washington Courthouse, which is my home, has a uh, has a nice local fireworks display. We get our blanket and we go out and we watch, and it's you know, it's it's always a it's always plus a lot of folks from the community, so it's always great. That's right, Free, freedom with a bang. That's kind of how I <laughs> look at. It. Uh, well, Paul, as we can as we approach the end of our episode, thank you so much for for coming on our program. You've really shared a lot of great stories, and I love what your students are doing. I think that practical approach to history is what makes it come alive. And I think what makes it come alive, particularly for these young students at such an early age, because I, I can tell you that if I, if I were in one of those experiences, I would certainly never forget that because you can always go back to that cemetery and just pause, reflect on the history and the service of those veterans uh, it, what you're doing is truly amazing, and not just and obviously your work for the Ohio State Board of Education. I really hope that you continue to broaden and and continue to push for for that uh, that pursuit of knowledge, a pursuit of civ- history and civics. Because frankly, we really need that nowadays. So thank you so much for your time and sharing, and hope you have a great Independence Day. Well, thank you, Sherman. This has been great. I love the conversation. And now to wrap up our 4th of July episode for 2022, here is our annual reading of the Declaration of Independence. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government, and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, 
let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained, and when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of an invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people, and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our own legislatures, and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death desolation and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. 
In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thank you all so much for listening to this interview episode and this year's reading of the Declaration of Independence. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of of the 4th of July festivities. As always, make sure to subscribe to our podcast if you haven't already. And I guess it's especially true on Independence Day, but on all days, a day in America is always better when we are with our friends and fellow citizens. 